Well, would you turn in your Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And we're going to be going to several places in the Scripture this morning, but we'll start in Matthew, chapter 6. And I, I think it's important, before we begin, to just say that this is not the kind of a message that people are going to go away necessarily feeling great about it afterwards. They will if it's applied, because this is a very, very liberating uh, subject if applied properly. But I think we need to think of it more in terms of, okay, we are learners from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are followers. We are disciples. So think of this message in terms of being disciples of Jesus and hearing from him on what he has to say concerning this all-important subject of forgiving others. We're not going to be focusing on primarily the forgiveness that we've received from God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be talking about the forgiveness that we are obliged to give to everybody who wounds us horizontally, the forgiveness that we give and extend to others. So that's the message. So I think that we need to focus on it and hear it uh, from the perspective of of disciples. And if you want to be a close follower of Jesus, then this is going to be something that's very important to you. If you don't want to be a close follower of Jesus, then this won't this won't do much for you. So that's basically the the approach that we're taking. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and thank you for your son and thank you for the gift of forgiveness that has been given to us. We're eternally indebted to you, Father. And we could never pay back anything that you've given us in terms of forgiveness. And we thank you for it. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd teach us this morning by your Spirit, illuminate our minds and hearts with your truth so that we can be and do exactly what you had in mind when you called a bride for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew 6, of course, we have the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, the disciple prayer, however you choose to name it. And Jesus told his disciples, in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We're going to focus on verse 12 and verses 14 and 15 this morning. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. For, verse 14 says, if you forgive men their trespasses, Your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So verse 12 is the statement that's part of the prayer. Verses 14 and 15 are Jesus' words amplifying the meaning of the statement. If we didn't get the meaning of the statement by praying the prayer or reading the prayer, we do get the meaning of the statement by reading verses 14 and 15, where he adds his commentary of what he's actually talking about. Therefore, verse 12 is not a prayer that we are praying to ask for forgiveness. Many times it's confused that way. We think that as we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, we're asking God to forgive us of our sins. We're not. There is no asking at all in that particular verse. It's a statement. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's a declaration. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If we do, our Father will forgive us. If we don't, our Father will not forgive us. It's very clear. God links his forgiveness 
of us to our forgiveness of others. Now, we're going to talk about what that means and what it doesn't mean, but that's very clear what Jesus said. If you forgive men their trespasses, your Father will forgive you. If you do not, he will not. It's very clear. It couldn't get any clearer than that. We don't want to try to explain this away. We don't try to, want to try to make it say something that it's not saying. We want it to say exactly what it says and let Jesus, who is the author of the statement, have his way in terms of what it means. What this actually is saying is, Father, use the standard that I use in dealing with the people who wound me as a standard you use in treating me in this life. Father, use the standard that I use in treating others as your standard in the way you're going to treat me in this life. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now pause that thought for a moment and think with me, if you will. God forgives our sins, all of them, past, present, and future, because of what Jesus did at Calvary. It's the only reason. By grace you are saved through faith. It's because when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Te telestai, the work has been done. The payment has been made in full for all of the sins that a person could forget, for, uh, commit in this life. Therefore, what they need to do is receive that forgiveness. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, John writes, My little children, I write these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, verse 2, is the propitiation for our sins. But not for our sins only, also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary paid for the sins of the entire world. Everyone's sins have been paid for. And it would be completely accurate to walk up some, to somebody at the gas pump and say, I got good news for you today. Your sins have been paid for. Now that doesn't mean, though, that their sins have been forgiven. Because they have to receive that gift by faith. But the sins have actually and obviously and completely been paid for. That's what 1 John 2.2 is telling us. So people don't go to hell because their sins haven't been paid for. People go to hell because they refuse to receive the gift of their sins having been paid for at Calvary. That's the only reason. So likewise, we forgive others because we have been forgiven. And if we have trouble forgiving someone else, it's probably because we have forgotten the huge debt that we owed God that he forgave us from. When I forget the degree to which I offended God and that my life has been lived contrary to his purposes and will and how I've broken his commandments and I've been a lawbreaker in my heart from the time I was born until the time I was regenerated or born again, if I forget that, then I forget just exactly how important the death of Jesus Christ is for me because he forgave me all, all of it and he's forgiven me of all the sins I've committed as a Christian which have been more than the sins I committed before I was a Christian, because I've lived a lot longer, for one reason, since I became a Christian. But I've been forgiven of it all, and it's wonderful. And when I recognize that, then I realize I am eternally in the debt of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so are you. But he's forgiven me, so I don't owe him anything because of my sin. Jesus paid it all. Right about this time in the message, maybe some of you are saying, well, forgiveness messages are good. I like them. I, I agree with them in principle. But it's very difficult for me because if I forgive that person, if I forgive that wound, that means that I have to go back into my relationship with that person, with him or with her. And I can't go back into that relationship with him or her because that person is not safe. In fact, that person is destructive, is toxic, is dangerous, and the relationship is dangerous. So I can't forgive that person because I can't go back into the relationship. So let's just comment on that briefly, and we'll come back to it later in the message. 
But there is a big difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. We are obligated and commanded to forgive. That doesn't mean that reconciliation will occur. We should want reconciliation, but it doesn't mean that reconciliation will occur. And unfortunately, I have to use an, uh, an example here that is painful. And it may be even painful for some of you women who have been abused in a marriage relationship, perhaps. And you're in a marriage relationship, a woman is in a marriage relationship, and the husband is brutal, the husband is verbally abusive, the husband may be physically abusive, the husband is dangerous, the husband is irresponsible, the husband is addicted to this or to that, the husband is a horrible, horrible human being. And she, out of a dutiful, obedient nature, wants to be submissive to her husband and stay in the marriage, but it becomes completely untenable. She's got to leave. She's got to get out. And then while she's out, she realizes, I need to forgive him. There have been tremendous wounds over the period of many years. But she says, I can't because if I do, I have to go back into that relationship. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Forgiveness is mandatory. Reconciliation requires two people who are mutually willing to be reconciled. It can't just be one person that desires to be reconciled. The other person has to desire it as well. And there has to be a humble coming together. And in that particular example that was just given, there's a lot of work that that man is going to have to do if he ever has an opportunity or ever even has the possibility to prove that he's a trustworthy man that is safe again. And that's on him. That's not on her. That's on him. And that's the way it works with Forgiveness and reconciliation. They're two different animals altogether, very different scenarios. Forgiveness is commanded. Forgiveness is part of the gospel. Reconciliation requires moat, much from both sides of the relationship. So Jesus said, if you don't forgive, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Now he's not talking about our eternal destiny. We've talked about that already because our salvation is the gift of God's grace. As the screen says, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace we've been saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. But it is talking about this statement, your father will not forgive your trespasses, or he will. It's talking about how the father will deal with us in this life as we walk on the earth. Okay, that's been said. I remember years ago, I was playing basketball with my son, who's now six foot four, and I wouldn't be playing basketball with him now. But back then, when he was a junior higher, he was still shorter than I was, so I could still play basketball with him. And he was doing something as we were playing. He was in junior high, and uh, he did something very junior high-ish, said something very junior high-ish. And I didn't like it. In fact, I was mad. And I'm dribbling the ball and plotting his demise <laughs> while I'm dribbling the ball. And the Lord speaks to my heart. He breaks through my anger, and he says, Bill... Do you want me to treat you in the same manner that you're considering treating your son right now? And it stopped me up short. I said, no, Father, I do not want you to treat me the way I'm considering treating my son right now. And then the next verse that came into my mind was, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And that's when I first began to get an inkling of this principle. The Father treats us the way we decide to treat others. If I'm gracious, then expect a gracious treatment from God. If I'm forgiving, then expect a, a forgiving treatment from God. If I'm unmerciful, then affect the Lord to be, expect the Lord to be tough on you. If I'm unforgiving, expect the Lord to do what he does with unforgiving people. Why does he do the remedial act of being tough on us if we're unmerciful or unforgiving? Why does he go that way? Why does he go in that direction? Because he's our father. And fathers are all about training us into the image of, of God himself and of Jesus. And of course, that's the father's purpose for us. How can he make us Christ-like if he doesn't discipline us? How can he make us Christ-like if he doesn't say, okay, drop your drawers, bend over, I'm going to give you a spanking here. And he does that. And he does it through treating us 
in a negative sense, which ends up being a positive sense because discipline's a good thing, by treating us the way we decide to treat others in this life. I forgave, a little bit of history here, testimony, I forgave my dad. My dad was a 40-year alcoholic and it wasn't pleasant growing up in that household. Three times my parents were married to each other, three times they were divorced from each other, all connected to his alcoholism. He wasn't the father that he could have been. He finally got sober when he was 56 years old and remained sober for the rest of his life, one day at a time, became a man that I consider to be one of my heroes. He was a godly man, loved Jesus, and became someone who helped others recover from alcohol addiction. Many, many men. In fact, back in Santa Cruz County where he lived, they called him Father Tom. They called him Father Tom because he would go to the AA meetings and you only give your first name. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm an alcoholic. So they didn't know what his last name was, so they just figured he's so spiritual and so godly. Let's just put a title to him. So they called him <laughs> Father Tom. But he was a great guy. But when I first got filled with the Spirit, I realized I need to forgive my dad. And I did. And that was a huge, huge thing for me to forgive him. And so I tried to treat him in a forgiving manner for the rest of uh, the time that he was still drinking uh, and, and all up through the rest of his life until he passed into heaven at age 83. I, I forgave other big picture individuals in my lives, pe people that had been pretty egregious in their and the wounds, and the very, very painful wounds that I experienced at their hand. And I, of course, had, I'm sure, caused wounds in others as well, and that's another matter altogether. But I forgave those, picture, uh, those people as well. In fact, there was one board member that I had where I pastored in Monterey for many years, who another pastor came in to try to help the situation. We were in a bit of a crisis he met this board member and he said, if you could have invented a Frankenstein of a board member, it, it would have been that board member. And uh, so uh, I forgave him though, and it was wonderful to experience some measure of reconciliation with him. All these things were part of my experience. So I wasn't aware uh, of anyone I'd not forgiven until I met Dr. Bruce Hebel who's a pastor, and who's written a book called Forgiving Forward. He was in East Texas for the purpose of sharing that he was going to come and do a Forgiving Forward uh, seminar in our area, and he wanted to explain what he, what he was doing. So he explained the premise of his book. He explained some of the ways he, uh, Jesus uh, was talking about forgiveness uh, in various places in the New Testament, and I was drawn in. I was drawn into what he said, so I got a copy of the book, and I read it for myself because some of the things he was saying that Jesus meant by what he said, I had not thought of before, particularly in one passage that we're going to look at. And so I had to check it out myself, being a Berean as I am, I had to check it out myself to see if my research equaled his research on what the text meant and what it was saying, and it did. So I read the whole book, not from the perspective of, okay, I can use this material and this is going to be good preaching material. I read it from the perspective of, I need this in my life, and I want the Lord to do something in me. And I quickly discovered in reading the book that one of the things that's important is to ask the Lord, is there anyone else that I have not forgiven? I didn't even think I needed to pray that prayer because I thought I'd forgiven pretty much everybody. But I started asking the Lord, is there anyone else that I need to forgive, any wound that I've experienced that I had not yet forgiven? And to my surprise, the Holy Spirit began to bring names of individuals, faces of individuals, situations from my past that I hadn't thought about for many years. And as he did, one at a time, I followed what we'll see are the protocols of forgiveness, and I forgave him. I forgave him vertically, because all forgiveness is directed to God the Father himself. 
and, and that's where it's applied. And what I experienced was surprising to me. I experienced freedom. I experienced liberty. I experienced joy that was deeper than I'd had in some time. Peace that was more profound than what I'd experienced in some time. And joy. And it began to drastically and wonderfully, positively affect my marriage. Because, you know, I can be a curmudgeon. <laughs> and I can let things get under my skin. But the forgiveness message just changed everything. It just began to be a source of freedom for me. And so it was a wonderful thing to experience. And so that's why we're talking about this. Because the Lord wants us to be free. The one who withholds forgiveness thinks that the other person is feeling the effect of the unforgiveness. Usually not. We're the ones that experience the, the effect of our own unforgiveness. The other person is pretty much either oblivious or doesn't care at all whether or not we forgive them. That's many times the case. Forgiveness, it's a big deal. C.S. Lewis is quoted as saying, everyone thinks that forgiveness is a grand idea until they have something to forgive. But we all have something to forgive. Bruce Hebel said, the author of the book, Forgiving Forward, the only ones who do not need to learn about forgiveness are those who have never been wounded by someone else. So who has never been wounded by someone else? That person doesn't exist. Who has ever become part of a church family, a fellowship that hasn't been wounded by somebody in that church family? Why is it we're surprised that we get wounded by somebody in the church family? Of course it's going to happen. We're fallible, fallen human beings that still struggle with the flesh. We still struggle with the devil and we still struggle with the world around us. So of course we're going to be offended at times. So we have to forgive. We get to forgive. We have lots of opportunities to learn how to forgive. So as I go forward in this, this sharing this morning, I can't help but tell you that I have borrowed heavily from what Bruce Hebel has written. Not only have I borrowed heavily from it, and I'm telling you and giving proper attribution to, to the source material, but I've told Bruce personally in email and in face-to-face -face conversations that I'm on a mission now, and I'm going to be stealing your book every single time I stand in front of a congregation to talk about forgiveness because it's been that impacting. And of course, he's very happy that that's going on. Another passage is in Mark chapter 11. So we're going to consider a few other passages and then give some real practical application on how to actually do this thing called forgiveness. Jesus said in Mark 11, verses 25 and 26, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, a few things are unique to the passage in Mark here that we've just read. Number one, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, oftentimes, this has been my experience, the memory of the wound or the memory of the person that I've been wounded by comes into my mind when I'm praying. I don't know why that is particularly. I just know that that's been my experience. It can happen in other times too, but it does happen when I'm in prayer. But another thing that's important here to note is that it's if I have anything against anyone, we're going to come to a passage in Matthew 18 where Jesus talks about the necessity of forgiving our brother. But this statement in Mark widens it to the, po the, the widest possible uh, measurement when he says, if you have anything against anyone, so no matter who they are and no matter what it is, we've got a responsibility to forgive. 
And that's a very, very big statement and a very important statement. And if we do forgive, then of course, our Father treats us in a forgiving manner. And if we don't, he, he won't. All of that is very, very important. So this clears up another misunderstanding. When we forgive, we are forgiving vertically in direction to God. We're not forgiving God. We're forgiving the person in prayer to God. When I forgave my dad, I went to my dad to tell him I was going to forgive him. And I sat down with him. And after, after I said, Dad, I'd like to speak with you, he said, OK. We went out on the back porch. And I started to tell him what I was forgiving him for. I forgive you for, I forgive you for, I for and he started getting angry. Because what I was doing was indicting him. My intention was to forgive him, but what I was actually doing was indicting him. And so he got angry, understandably. And in one of the most supernatural moments of my whole life, that whole thing got turned around. His neck was, the veins were starting to bolt. He's a big guy, 6'2", about 230. <laughs> and I'm not 6'2 and 230. So I could have been in some danger there. So this is very miraculous what happened. The brakes stopped in my heart on that line of inquiry. <laughs> completely stopped. Went completely in the opposite direction. I said, Dad, what I really want to say is I love you. I want to have a relationship with you as, my, as, as your son and you as my father. And um, I'm really sorry for the way I've been as a son over these years and how I've failed you. That was amazing that those words even came out of my mouth. But they didn't just come out of my heart, mouth, they came out of my heart. That's how the Lord turned that conversation around. And I went away from that encounter realizing that I didn't need to go and tell my dad that I forgave him. I just needed to forgive him. And that forgiveness is in prayer to God. Father, I forgive my father, my earthly dad, for this and this and this wound. And I put it where it belongs at the feet of Jesus, because his death paid for those sins, and he doesn't owe me anything because Jesus paid it all. So I put that sin where it belongs, and I pray for blessing upon my dad. That's all I needed to do. And this is one of the reasons why, when uh, we realize that we need to forgive that father or that relative or even that child, perhaps that wounded us deeply, and now they've, they've gone, they've dis they've They've passed away. They're not around. We can't go to them. We can't talk to them. We can't have a conversation with them and tell them. We don't need to have a conversation with them. We can forgive them and that wound in our hearts even though they've passed away. Because we're not talking to the deceased. We're talking to the Father about the wound that was uh, ours because of what they said or did. Very important. Very, very important. So all of these things are very important with regard to forgiveness, but as we come to this next passage, which is our last passage, in Matthew 18, please turn there. This is a passage that shocks us. Shocked me. And its implications are wonderful and terrible at the same time. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, the whole section begins with a question that Peter asks Jesus. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now Peter was going beyond what the Pharisees and scribes and the teachers of the law said in that day. They required as many as two times, sometimes three acts of forgiveness against a brother. But Peter went double that and added one <laughs> up to seven times. I'm sure that Peter probably felt very generous in his offer. And he was. And Jesus answers Peter. He says to him, I do not say to you up to seven times. I'm not putting that kind of a limitation on it, Peter. What I am saying to you is up to 70 times 7, 490 times for you math majors. But that doesn't mean that we're counting. 
So we're at 480, and we go, okay, just 10 more, and I don't have to forgive him anymore. <laughs> it's not like that at all. It's basically hyperbole, exaggeration, that shows that it's an unlimited number of times that we forgive someone else. Now, in another passage, Jesus promised his disciples that offenses would come, that they'd be wounded. He told them, Luke 17, 3, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And I remember reading that verse years ago, and I'm thinking, right on. There's an escape clause. If he repents, forgive him. If he doesn't repent, that's the inference. You don't have to forgive him. So the Pharisee in me loves the escapes clause. But then I kept reading. Jesus has more to say. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Okay. Again, it's hyperbole, but what is it teaching? Imagine that scenario in real life. You're, you're on the job. You start your day at 7 a.m. and you go into the break room at 8 a.m. and one of your coworkers says, you know, Charlie over there, he's been talking smack against you. This is what he said. Really? You go to Charlie, you say, Charlie, did you really say this? Yeah, oh yeah, I did. Oh, man, I'm really sorry. I repent. Okay, I forgive you. 9.30, you go in for another break. Somebody else comes. Did you know that Charlie over there is talking smack against you? Really? You go to Charlie again. Charlie, really? Again? Yeah, oh, man, I'm really sorry. Yeah, I repent. I forgive you, Charlie. Happens again at noon. It happens again at one. What are you starting to think? Charlie doesn't mean it. The words are, I repent. The words are, I'm sorry. But there's no repentance because repentance is a change of mind which leads to a change of heart, which leads to a change of action. There's been no repentance with Charlie. He keeps doing it and doing it and doing it. So what does that mean for me? I'm required to forgive him even if he says he repents and he's not sincere. So the escape clause was removed from me. <laughs> and I realized, okay, if I'm offended, just like Jesus said in Mark 11, no matter what anyone does to me and how egregious the offense was, I must forgive. Well, the disciples they understood how intense Jesus was when he said what he just said, that you've got to forgive everybody basically of everything, even if they're not sincere. They said to Jesus, the apostles now are the ones saying this, Lord, increase our faith. They said, basically, their, their approach was, you're telling us to do something which is so unimaginable, so impossible, that the only way we could do this is if we had more faith. So increase our faith. That's what they thought they needed, was more faith to obey this command to forgive everybody of everything, even if they're not sincere. But they didn't need more faith to do this. What they did need instead was obedience. In other words, all they needed to do is what you and I need to do. We simply need to do what we're told. It's an old-fashioned concept, obedience. But sometimes we just have to plain old do what we're told. Just do what you're, we're told, period, obey. And so Jesus goes on and tells them essentially that. You know, you, if you had a servant uh, coming in from the field, he's working all day out in the field for you as your servant, uh, are you going to greet him into your home and are you going to tell him, okay, go ahead and wash your feet, prepare yourself and gird yourself and sit down and I'll prepare this great meal for you? No, that's not the way it works. Masters don't typically treat their servants that way. But instead, uh, that person should say, we're unprofitable servants. We've only done what was our duty to do. And Jesus said, when you've done all these things that you were commanded, now he's speaking to his apostles. 
Just like that servant needed to say, we're unprofitable servants. We've only done that which was our duty to do. Jesus said, so when you, you apostles, have done all those things which you're commanded, forgive others even if they're not sincere. Say, we're unprofitable servants. We've done what was our duty to do. In other words, just obey. So we go back to Matthew 18. Now Jesus goes on to tell his disciples what the kingdom of heaven is like. Time to tune in. He's going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, verse 18, verse 23, excuse me, Matthew 18. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. Okay, well, probably a very common occurrence, kings settling accounts with their servants. One owes an exorbitant amount, can't pay. The king, the master, does what would be typical in that day, sell the man, sell his wife, sell his children, and everything that he has, and he makes payment. 10,000 talents are what the man in this parable owed the king. So what do we know about a talent? A talent is a weight. So there can be a talent of gold, there can be a talent of silver. It's just a weight. It's a measurement of weight, like a pound is a measurement of weight. One talent equaled 60 minas, or minas. A mina was a unit of money. Uh, one talent equaled 15 years of wages because one mina equaled three months' wages. There were 10,000 of them. That means that there were 10,000 talents times 15 years of wages, which means that there were 150,000 years of wages that this servant owed the king. Okay, let's just say that the going annual income was 50,000. <laughs> People in Southern California laugh at that number. But anyway, in Texas where we live, that's a reasonable number. <laughs> 50,000. That 150,000 years times $50,000 per year equals $7.5 billion. That's the equivalent of what this man owed the king. It's amazing debt. Huge amount. Unpayable. I mean, some in our current world could pay that, but they're very rare. The servant, realizing what the king was going to do, throwing him into prison and being sold, his wife, his children, and everything he had, the servant fell down before the king saying, Master, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. I mean, he fully realized what he owed his master, but he said, Master, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. And the master of that servant, the king, was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Amazing. It's amazing. Not only did he say to the man, you don't owe me seven and a half billion anymore. He's absorbing it because he's never going to get that back. Never going to get it back. He's never going to see that seven and a half billion that he forgave his servant of. He had compassion. But notice that the servant in the parable didn't ask to be forgiven of the debt. He asked for more time. Have patience with me and I will pay you all. Just give me more time. How many lifetimes would he have to live to pay seven and a half billion dollars off? You could, you could live a thousand lifetimes and not be able to pay off a debt like that. It was unpayable. So he is completely forgiven and freed. None of these things are going to happen to him. He's not going to be sold. His wife's not going to be sold. His children aren't going to be sold. His possessions aren't going to be sold. He's not going to be thrown into prison. 
but he's free, completely free. That's what it feels like to be forgiven of sins, by the way. We're completely free. It's amazing. The debt we owe to God, unpayable. But he says, I freely forgive you all. The religion of work says, have patience with me, I'll pay you all. Just give me more time, I can pay it back. I can make it good. But that's not even good enough. The religion of grace says, I surrender all, all to you I owe. You've paid the debt, and I couldn't pay it at all. That's the grace of God. So what does this servant do, this forgiven servant do? What would you do? What would I do? Man, I just, I just got forgiven seven and a half billion. The pressure's off. I would call a party of all the people I knew, and we would have a celebration, a rejoicing of the being forgiven of this debt. That's not what he did. That's not what this servant did. That servant went out, and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He goes on the prowl, looking for those who owe him money, even though he'd been forgiven seven and a half billion. Hundred denarii, a hundred days wages. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me. I'll pay you all. Now you're that servant, you're that servant in the parable. You've heard these words before. Have patience with me. Where have I heard these words? Wait a minute. That's what I said to the king. Not long ago, I said those same words to the king. And here my debtor, who owes me just 100 days wages, $17,000. He's asking for time just like I asked for time. Same thing. Have patience with me. I'll pay you all. He wouldn't. Verse 30. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. Debtor's prison. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved, came and told their master, the king, all that had been done. What's his reaction? Well, we're going to see that he was very grieved and angry. They were grieved to hear about what this man had done. They told the king about it. Nobody was happy with this. This was the most ingracious, ungrateful action they'd ever seen in their lives. This person refusing to forgive a very, very small debt by comparison to the seven and a half billion that he had owed the king. Everybody could see it. Rationally, it made no sense to, to not forgive the smaller debt. Rationally, it made no sense to not be grateful about the huge debt that he'd been freed from. So the master, the king, has something to do here. Verse 32, his master, after he called him, said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. What did this servant owe the king at this point? He delivered him to the torturers, those that were going to beat him, interrogate him, inflict pain upon him until he should pay all that was due to the king. What did he owe the king? He did not owe seven and a half billion because the king had already forgiven that. What did he owe the king? What he owed the king was the forgiveness of his servant. If he paid that by forgiving his own servant, okay, okay, I get it. I should have been grateful. I should have been gracious toward my own servant. I forgive you, man. You don't owe me 100 dinar anymore. That's when the king would release him. But he would be delivered to the torturers to torment. And the word is very interesting. It's, it's not just dealing with physical torment. It can refer to emotional and, and physical, obviously, torment. 
but it can also refer to the kind of torment that is inflicting uh, itself upon people through demonic forces. Delivered to the torturers, the king did, until he should pay all that was due him. Until this man was willing to come around to the side of forgiveness of his, uh, of his own servant, he was going to be under torture. So Jesus ends the parable. That's it. The parable is over with. Now he's going to give the application in one singular verse. Verse 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you if you from your heart do not forgive your brother his trespasses. My heavenly Father, Jesus says, and who knows the heavenly Father better than Jesus? My heavenly Father will also do this to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So the question is, what will the heavenly Father do to us if we from our hearts do not forgive our brother their trespasses. He will do what he did to the servant. He will deliver us to the torturers. That's what he'll do. This is part of his divine discipline and chastening so that we'll get the message that forgiveness is important. He'll deliver us to the torturers. Remember the rich man in Lazarus in Luke 16? The rich man was in agony. He was in hell. Suffering because of the heat of the flames. And Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom on the other side of the chasm. And and the rich man cried out to Abraham and asked Abraham to send Lazarus to just touch his tongue with a drop of water to relieve him of the pain and the misery and the torment he was experiencing in that hot place. The torment he was in, as Luke describes it in Luke 16, it's the same word that's used here for torturers. It's under torture. The Father will do this. The Father gives legal authority to even certain demonic forces to make life horrible for the unforgiving. And a lot of times we don't even know life is horrible for the unforgiving. You see somebody that's just constantly angry. There's an instant chip on their shoulder and you have to be so careful about what you say around that person because anything can set them off and it could even be dangerous. Most of the time, that anger can be connected to unforgiveness in that person's life. Or you see somebody who gets wounded at a church and rather than forgive and rather than be gracious in that situation, They go away mad. Well, that going away mad is going to mean that eventually they're going to go away bitter. And that bitterness is a poison within their own soul that will ruin them. That church that they left in anger isn't being affected directly by the poison that's in their soul, but that next congregation is. Because that person is taking that poison into the next group of people that they're supposedly going to be connecting with. You go back to unforgiveness as the root cause of it all. It's the torturers. That's what's going on. The torturers are having their field day. What does torture look like? Well, it can look like depression, which is basically born out of hopelessness, which can often be connected to This very thing, unforgiveness. Bitterness. Various addictions can be traced to the lack of forgiveness. A compensation for the pain of unforgiveness. Start taking this, drinking that, shooting this up. Becoming an addict. You could add physical maladies or diseases that are caused directly through internal conflict of the soul. Researchers have proven that cancer, ulcers, heart issues often are connected to either accelerated stress or depression or bitterness. These matters of the soul can have a tremendous effect negatively on the matters of the body. 
And the Father will do this. He will deliver the unforgiving to the torturers until all is paid that is due the Father. What's due the Father? The Father makes it really clear. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. And if you do, your Father will treat you in a forgiving manner. If you don't, he won't. The delivery to the torture is because he loves us too much to keep us in this place that is so unhealthy for us. So he delivers us to the torturers. It's natural consequences discipline. Why does God discipline the sin of unforgiveness more than any other sin? It seems like he does. Because forgiveness is at the very core of the gospel. The gospel and forgiveness are... Siamese twins, they belong together. When Jesus gave uh, the Lukean version of the Great Commission in chapter 24 of Luke, it says, when you go out and you preach, you're going to be preaching repentance and the remission of sins in the name of the Lord to all nations. And we're glad that this is the case that Jesus bore all our sins in his own body on the tree and that they're all paid in full. But when we refuse to forgive, what we're saying is, that other person, what they've done to me, they owe me. But if I say what that person has done to me, that wound that they did to me, they owe me, if that's what I'm saying, this is what I'm really saying, the death of Jesus and his payment for sins wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. And if I refuse to forgive, I am demeaning the cross. Nobody wants to do that. That's a serious follower of Jesus. No one wants to demean the cross or lessen its amazing impact and glory. Paul said in Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ my Lord. I mean, that's the very thing to boast about. We don't want to demean it. But that's what we're saying if we say that they owe me, and I refuse to forgive because they owe me. The blood of Jesus covers all sins, including the ones committed against us, even the sins that wound us. Brothers and sisters, I don't have to tell you this, but I think we all know this. But the world around us is watching to see whether or not we're actually going to live this way. They are. When we do live this way amongst ourselves, and when this congregation lives this way toward other congregations in the community that are loyal to Jesus and to the Bible, the community sees it. They do. And the chief thing that they see is the graciousness that is extended because of the forgiveness that has been granted. But when there's acrimony and division and splits, even the world groans about things like that when they appear in churches. Everybody knows there's something wrong, wrong with this picture. These things should not be. Movements. One movement starts out of another movement. And the movements are angry at each other. And there's no forgiveness. There's been no public statement. Oh yeah, we've forgiven them. They, you know, we've gone different ways, but we, we love each other and we're going to show that love. That doesn't happen sometimes. And when it doesn't, even the world writes news articles on it. And the bloggers have a field day. And they expose all of the things that are wrong with either side of the movement. It brings shame to the church. It brings shame to the church, all because of unforgiveness. It's all connected to that. Remember Saul of Tarsus? Who did he become? Paul. Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle. That's how we know him. But remember Saul, before he yielded to Jesus as Messiah, he watched someone die. Stephen. 
One of the seven from Acts chapter 6. An evangelist. He watched Stephen die. He was stoned to death. There in Jerusalem. And as he watched Stephen die, he saw Jesus, or saw Stephen say these words to Jesus, whom he saw at the right hand of God. Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. I forgive them. Guarantee. Saul of Tarsus had never seen anything like that in his whole life. But he saw it that day. He saw forgiveness coming from a man that was being stoned to death. Oh, he'd seen others being stoned to death. He'd never seen that, though. Never forgiveness. And he, this is my opinion now, I don't think he could ever shake that memory. I think it haunted him. I think he had bad dreams about it at night. I think he thought about it a lot. And he was trying to wiggle out of what that meant. Implications in his own life. If this man, Stephen, could actually say that he saw Jesus and seeing Jesus could forgive those that were stoning him to death, that gives credibility and legitimacy to Jesus. Jesus must be somebody important. And he didn't want that to be the reality in his own life. He was running from Jesus. So when on the road to Damascus... A blinding light occurred, and Paul fell to the ground, and a voice came saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then Jesus said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. It's hard for you to try to kick out of the the yoke that I've got you in. And you've been struggling at it for some time, and I think he was trying to kick against the goads because of what he saw with Stephen. The impact of forgiveness on people when they see it. It's amazing. And it will be amazing when it comes out of our own lives. Okay, so now I'm going to wrap up quickly. I've kept you a long time, and thank you for your patience. Some things about forgiveness. Forgiveness, first of all, does not say that what the person did is okay. It's not okay. Never okay. We don't excuse sin by whitewashing it. No, it's not okay. Number two, forgiveness doesn't mean that we're reconciled with the one we've forgiven. We've already talked about that. For reconciliation to take place, the wounded one says what they did wrong was wrong, but Jesus paid for it. The one who caused the wounds says, what I did was wrong, Jesus paid for it, and I'm going to dedicate my life to make it right. That's reconciliation. So that leads us to what Bruce Hebel in his book, Forgiving Forward, and I obviously recommend the book. But this little thing is a bookmark, and on the back of it are what Bruce calls the seven protocols of forgiveness, which I find highly biblical. So we're going to go through these very quickly. Seven protocols. Protocol number one, thank God for forgiving you. Now I have this in my Bible. And I pull it out literally every morning. And I review it. Sometimes I spend a little more time like I did the other day. I spent probably a half an hour with this. Very liberating. Very illuminating. But the first one is thank God for forgiving you. Look what God has forgiven me. And just ponder the cross. Ponder the depth of forgiveness. Oh man, we feel so grateful to God and so undeserving of it all. And then when it comes to actually the subject of forgiving somebody else, it seems a lot less, doesn't it? Oh Lord, thank you. 10,000 talents forgiven. Oh Lord, but 100 denarii over here, not a big deal. I forgive them, Lord. That's basically what we're saying. Number two protocol, repent of your sin of unforgiveness. And that's exactly as it reads. Repent of your sin of unforgiveness. It is a sin to not forgive. And the only way to get out of it is to repent. That is to change my mind. 
about this forgiveness issue. I change my mind. I'm not going to be unforgiving. I'm going to be forgiving. And I'm going to let the Lord work it into my heart, and it's going to lead directly into my immediate actions. I repent of my sin of unforgiveness and how wrong and egregious it is to sin by not forgiving. And then that leads me to the next protocol. Number three, ask God, who do I need to forgive and for what? This is where we're laying our souls open before the Lord. And there's scriptural precedent. Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. True believers in Jesus love the conviction of sin. They love it. Because it's the Holy Spirit showing us where we've gone off track and it's the Holy Spirit showing us what we need to do to get right back on track. It gives us hope. We can do something about this sin issue. We love conviction. Because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. So we say, protocol number three, who do I need to forgive and for what? And he will begin to show us over time. And one at a time, as he shows us, as we can handle it, one at a time, we forgive that wound, we forgive the person who inflicted the wound. Each time we do, each time we're involved in a, in a forgiveness event with regard to a wound or a person, we have to forgive that person from our heart. Why from our heart? Because that's where the wound was felt, in our heart. So we have to forgive from our heart. So we say, Lord, I choose to forgive so-and-so from my heart for whatever they did. Real specific. And then after I'm done with that, Lord, is there anything else I need to forgive so-and-so for? And then, Lord, I declare that this person is no longer in my debt. I transfer their debt to the cross where it belongs. Jesus paid for it. That's wonderful. I've forgiven the person. But there's more. Just like in the infomercial, wait, there's more. (laughs) Ask God to bless that person. And look for ways to bless them when possible. This is where it gets dicey for some people because they can't imagine themselves praying a blessing upon somebody that has wounded them. But it's necessary. In fact, I would say that if I can't pray for a blessing or if I'm unwilling to pray for a blessing upon the person that's wounded me, I've not really forgiven them. And oftentimes the blessing can be connected with the wound that they inflicted. Somebody wounds wounds me by lying about me and slandering my reputation. So I pray for blessing. Lord, just give this person favor in their job, in their family, in their community. Just bless them, Lord, with with just a, a persona of being liked by others and appreciated by others. I'm praying blessing upon that person. And then... Sixth protocol, commit to not remember the offense. Now that's impossible. We will remember the offense. But when we do remember the offense, when the memory comes, we can say, Lord, I specifically remember forgiving so-and-so for that. I don't have to do a whole thing, forgiveness again. I already forgave him. I'm just reminding the Lord and myself that I specifically remember forgiving that. And thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness, freedom that you've brought me. And I bless the person again. Pray for reconciliation. We need to pray for reconciliation. With wisdom. But pray for reconciliation. And then protocol number seven, make pre-forgiveness a lifestyle. Make pre-forgiveness a lifestyle. In reality, no matter what environment I find myself involved in, no matter whether it's a Facebook group or whether it's a church community or whether it's my work community or people that I'm in my family, 
I know that there are going to be wounds associated with being close to other human beings. But I've already decided when that happens, I'm going to forgive. I am, because Jesus already paid for those sins. He already paid for them at Calvary. This is uh, an hour of conversation about this one way, but it's a lifetime of application. This will do all of us great good if we actually obey it and practice it. You with me? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for all that the gospel has brought to us. Father, we have deep, profound respect for you as our Father. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. And we have deep and profound respect for your wisdom that you'll even turn us over to the torturers if we refuse to forgive. But you'll do it so that you can bring us back to forgiveness. Lord, we have profound respect for you because you sent your son to pay for our sins and that that death really literally did cover the, de- the, the sins that had always or ever would be forgiven, uh, committed. Every sin ever committed, past, present, future. Jesus' death was sufficient. And that's because of you, Lord. That's because of the, uh, the work of Jesus was the propitiation before you for our sins. We thank you, Father. Now we pray for wisdom, that we would walk worthy of you in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we would walk worthy of of you, Lord, in the matter of, of forgiveness. Lord, we pray that you'd make us change agents in relationships around us, that we would be part of a a revolution of forgiveness. But start with us, Lord, not with the pink finger pointing and not with the blaming or the blame shifting, Lord, but start with us in our own hearts what you want to do in us and through us. And we thank you for it. Bless Calvary Chapel of Los Alamitos, Lord, we pray. We pray that you continue to bless uh, Pastor Brian and Cheryl as they minister and lead and make disciples in this community. And Lord, we thank you for the work that you're doing and that you have done that you're going to do here in Rossmore, Los Alamitos, and the surrounding communities. We commit ourselves to you, Lord, this morning. We're in debt, but not really because you've forgiven us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.